Welcome to the Aspen Institute's Hearst Lecture Series program featuring Sonia Diaz, Jacqueline Martinez Garcel, Alex Sanchez, Beatrice Soto, and Dominica Lynch. I'm Crystal Logan, Vice President of Aspen Community Programs and Engagement here at the Aspen Institute. And I first want to thank uh, Bob and Soledad Hurst for making this series possible. Thanks to our audience for tuning in for this important conversation. As I introduce our guests, you'll find links to their bios in the chat, as well as other important information throughout the event. During the event, you can pose questions to our panelists by typing those into the Q&A feature. Sonia Diaz is founding director of the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative, and she leads the first multi-issue think tank focused on Latinos in the University of California. Jacqueline Martinez Garcel is the uh, CEO of the Latino Community Foundation, which leads one of the largest networks of Latino philanthropists in the country. Alex Sanchez is co-founder and managing director of Voces Unidas here in the Roaring Fork Valley. Uh, he's a trustee of Colorado Mesa University appointed by Governor Polis. Beatrice Soto is the director of Defienda Nuestra Tierra at the uh, Wilderness Workshop, which is a revered conservation organization based here in the Roaring Fork Valley. And finally, our moderator today is Dominica Lynch. She is the uh, executive director of the Aspen Institute's Latinos and in Society program. And she served most recently as the president and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. This is a powerhouse panel. We're honored and thrilled to feature you all here today. And with that, over to you, Dominica. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. And thank you for all that you and your team does to keep the Aspen community engaged. Good afternoon to our audience and our friends from across the country. I am delighted that you've chosen to spend the next hour with us. I am Dominica, and this is my first week with the Aspen Institute. Delighted to head a program that focuses on Latinos. Our mission is to identify and catalyze ideas and solutions that foster greater opportunities for American Latinos, and in doing so, promoting a more prosperous and inclusive America for all people. So today's topic, I'm excited to moderate by the people, for the people, Latino-driven solutions and community resilience in a time of crisis. Our conversation is grounded in the notion that authentic change begins within communities first. Today, we will hear a national perspective on the status of Latinos in the face of the pandemic and from local recovery efforts in California and Colorado, Roaring Fork Valley and Aspen community, Panelists will explain why Latino economic recovery efforts and addressing health disparities are critical for our country's economic recovery as a whole. But before we jump into the conversation, we wanna test how much you already know about Latinos in the United States. So you're gonna see a poll pop up right about now. Take under a minute to answer the questions. Our goal is to clarify some common misconceptions about Latinos in the United States. And while you're answering, please stay till the end of the broadcast so that you can ask your questions of our panelists and also that you can enjoy a special musical performance. Okay, let's see. In just a few moments, we will have the results. All right. So the first question, the nation's Latino population stands at nearly, and the correct answer is 60.6 million. So about half of you got that correct. So 60 million is about 18% of the total US population. And according to census projections, Latinos are expected to grow to 30% of the total US population by the year 2060. Important to know that two thirds of Latinos are US born and that one in every four children under the age of 18 is Latino. All right, question number two. The majority of you got that, let me see. Uh, true or false, Hispanics can be of any race. So about 86% of you got that right. Uh, let's see, Hispanic community is not monolithic. The Hispanic community is also known as a Latinx community. We are diversity, race, ethnicity, political orientation, and socioeconomic status. 
And the final question, Latinos uh, owned businesses, Latino owned businesses contribute an incredible, and the correct answer is 700 billion to the US economy each year. Before the pandemic, there were 4.6 million Latino owned businesses in the United States. One in four of all new businesses in the US are started by Latino entrepreneurs. Latino entrepreneurs start new companies at more than twice the rate of all other groups in the country. And now this is important to, to note, if US Latinos at 60 million would be a separate country, we would have the eighth largest economy in the world with an annual GDP of 2.1 trillion. So now that we've established that Latinos are large in numbers and diverse, we're the economic engine that drives growth in the United States, we can now begin our conversation. Nearly six months into the coronavirus, the pandemic continues to devastate thousands and thousands of families at an alarming rate. Latinos, like many other Americans, are still fighting for their lives and livelihoods. However, the fact is that COVID-19 has exacerbated longstanding social inequality systemic racism and anti-blackness. For, fam for Latino families across the country, COVID-19 has had a devastating health and economic consequences. According to the Center for Disease Control, Latinos make up 34% of the total COVID cases and nearly 20% of the deaths. Compounding the problem is that we're in a pandemic recession and the unemployment rate is up uh, small businesses are shuttering, people are losing their jobs by the millions. The overall unemployment rate for the country is 10%, for Latinos is even higher at 13%. So now let's turn to the panelists for our first question. Why have Latinos been so disproportionately impacted by COVID-19? And what social conditions have led to this? So Sonia, let's start, let's start with you to give us a national perspective. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Very excited to engage with Aspen on this important topic. It's really a misunderstanding in terms of the impact of Latinos being something that Latinos can control. There are structural and systemic issues that have only worsened inequality. And so some research out of UCLA in particular has found Latinos are less likely to be covered in terms of health insurance than other demographics. That's true in California. They also are facing difficulties along with African American communities to shelter in place, meaning they live in high dense areas. They don't have access to a personal vehicle, green space or a grocery store because of food deserts. Other issues are really economic. And we saw that COVID-19 and the stay-at-home orders had a disproportionate impact on Asian Americans and Latinos because they were so overly concentrated in the retail and service sectors. We now know in terms of the outrageous disparities that are occurring by race ethnicity, whereby African Americans, Latinos, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are having disproportionate impacts in terms of infections and death rates it's correlated to working conditions. The people that are safeguarding American life during this unprecedented pandemic are our frontline essential workers who are overwhelmingly of color and many of them are Latinos. And they are going to work every day without the safety protections and institution building to know that they could stay home and be safe. And so those are some of the issues that we're confronting right now. And it's a failure of systems and it's resulted in unnecessary loss of life. And for Jacqueline, I wanna to turn to you in California, the Golden State, uh, we've seen a spike. 55% of the cases reported there are Latinos and 45% of the deaths. Can you share a little bit of what you're seeing on the ground? Yeah, you called it the Golden State, not feeling very golden these days, Dominica. Um, the inequities that Sonia pointed out to have really put the Latino population at highest risk in the state of California. And it's not even uh, throughout the state. If you, I like to think of San Francisco and LA as emerald cities, right? And then you have the Valley, Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, Inland Empire, 
the Imperial Valley, these are places that have long been forgotten and disinvestments for decades, if not centuries. And the people living in these regions have been the ones that have been most impacted. And yes, to quote your numbers, uh, we're making close, actually closer now to 59% of all cases, yet we make 39% of the population. If you look at places like the San Joaquin Valley, the numbers are even higher and the death rates are higher and they're higher among the younger population. So the 18 and 34 year olds, as Sonia was mentioning, are the ones that are making up our essential work. Um, and, you know, one thing that I want to clarify for the audience is that as a country, we've been talking about essential workers. Really, what we value are the essential work. We have not valued the people making up those jobs. And in the state of California, where close to 2 million are undocumented. I wanna bring that up. 80% of them make up jobs that are considered essential. And right now we have not done right by them in providing them the resources, financial resources, the protections that they need to live. And it's an inhumane case for our state. I wanna come back to you, but I wanna hear about what's happening in Colorado. So Alex and Beatrice, give us an update. So um, I'm happy to start Alex, but um, kind of what you were mentioning, you know, institutional, institutional and systematic racism, weak safety nets and the lack of engagement with our community are really being really obvious. Um, at a local level, we represent approximately 30% of the population and 70% of the COVID cases are Latinos. Um, you know, the lack of leadership and, you know, the lack of communication with our community and you know, just really thinking that we're really progressive and that we have everything under control and never really dealing with these issues um, or even wanting to talk to them um, now is like surfacing and we're realizing you know, it's time to really address a lot of these issues. Thank you, Dominica. You know, um, we started Voces Unidas de las Montañas as the first um, Latino created and Latino led nonprofit uh, in the region to address the long-standing inequities in our valleys. Uh, and it starts with you know, learning to share power and to, and to create social capita within the Latino community. We represent 30% of the entire, of all three counties um, it, of the region. There are 35,000 Latinas and Latinos uh, in our region. And COVID, all that COVID did is just highlight the inequities that have existed uh, in our communities for too long. They're systemic. They're systems that have intended and unintended consequences into the points that Beatriz is making. Um, disproportionality is, is is, you know, mean something else in communities like Garfield County, where 70% of all positive cases, 70% of all active, uh, you know, positive cases are Latinos, where we only represent 30% of that population. So these are systemic failures. Um, these are vacuums that have existed. Um, and this is why we as organizations need to be able to be part of the solution. People of color who are being disproportionately impacted need to be at the table. And that's what Voces Unidas is all about. Uh, giving people voice, uh, creating social capital and creating opportunities for people to lead in their own communities. I want to commend you, Alex, and Beatriz for co-founding Voces Unidas de las Montañas. And I, it's really unbelievable. You started, the startup was in May of this year. So, so timely. So I really want to uh, commend you and applaud you for that. And I'm also thinking as a fundraiser, man, that must have been tough. <laughs> and, uh, and I want to talk about the resources and the infusion of capital in our communities, many levels. So I'm gonna pivot back to Jacqueline because you've done such a tremendous job with the Latino Community Foundation in the state of California. And, and wanna you know, share uh, any best practices and how you really organize funding for regions that have the most essential workers. And, and noting that funding is 1.1% of philanthropic dollars go to Latino led organizations. So I don't know how you do it, but please tell us. Thank you, Dominica. And I just have to say the Latino Community Foundation exists to unleash the power, the civic and economic power of all Latinos in the state of California. We were tired of using that number, 1.1% of all philanthropic resources invested in Latino-led organizations and wanted to create a solution for it. So we gathered um, our people and said, you know, it's time for us to just pull our resources together and invest back. And we've started the largest network of giving circles in the country that bring together 
are people of all ages, of all sectors to pull resources together and invest in these organizations that are trusted, that are grassroots, who are the go-to place for families, not only in crises, but in moments like when 2020 started, we were concerned about voting and census. These are the organizations that are organizing young people to get out the vote and, and, and fill out the census. And so as an organization, we're committed to investing in that leadership. The Giving Circle is one approach. We partner with a number of foundations in the state of California nationally to also invest in these groups. But more importantly, our message to um, the general population is that we don't have to wait to be a Bill Gates. Like philanthropy is meant for all of us and it runs in the DNA of our culture. How many of us, um, when we get that paycheck, we're sending money back home to our parents or to our family members. So that generosity and that willingness to invest in each other already exists. And I just want to share that, you know, when March 16th happened and we went into shelter in place on March 17th, we launched the Love Not Fear Fund. And we did that immediately because we knew that the impact was going to be felt immediately. I don't know why anyone is surprised right now that Black and Latinos and Indigenous folks are the ones who are impacted by this virus. To Sonia's point again, this virus took the path of the systems that we already had in place. And so we mobilized really quickly and set up this fund to first uh, make sure that there was financial support to families who were gonna be let go of, families who were undocumented in the Central Valley, the seniors that right now um, don't are not eligible for Medi-Cal because they're undocumented. And so it was really important for us to pull resources together. And we raised close to 1.9 million, but it's not really a drop in the bucket. More importantly, we worked together with other foundations, state of California, to also urge our governor to also invest public dollars. Uh, we can't forget about those that um, are not documented when they, in fact, are the ones that are putting food on our table. And so it requires philanthropy. It also requires a response from the public sector. Now more than ever, you know, our governors and our mayors, their main responsibility is to take care of human life and do it in a humane way with dignity. You know, Jacqueline, the work that you're doing and Alex and Beatriz is an example of that local determinism that we're seeing throughout the country. So with that, I want to now turn to Sonia. You have this amazing uh, vision for equity in a post-pandemic world. The report was released, I think, just a few weeks ago that addressed some policy issues that can really create a better world for Latinos and everybody. Can you share a little bit about that? Absolutely, and I think this is a really important time to see the intersection of policy. It's not that we're just in a pandemic. We're under siege in terms of our own homes, in terms of our jobs, schools, and then our democracy, frankly. And so to that end, uh, the work that I do is really under this, this clear idea that every issue is a Latino issue. Latinos are not a monolith. There's so much heterogeneity amongst the community but what is important is that policy can still center on the needs of this demographic, which is the second largest population group in the United States. Understand that by the next uh, decade, one in four people in Colorado will be Latino. And so what we endeavored to do was to ensure we had a multi-generational cross-sectoral group of Latino leaders with a footprint in California, but a national platform to identify what is the path forward for all Americans, frankly, for economic opportunity and social mobility, for housing, for voting rights and political representation, and for health? And it was very clear that these Latino leaders know that they need to stand in solidarity with our Black community members and support them. And we also know that there is no path forward that takes us back to pre-COVID America whereby so many people were already struggling. But the real reform will come with dealing with these systems in a thoughtful way that thinks about the communities that are most impacted. And so we put together a Latino agenda for the 21st century. We've shared it with all of our elected officials, with the two major political parties and with philanthropy. And we're hoping that this idea that we need to invest in leadership of color. I mean, we have two local leaders here, Alex and Beatriz, of thinking through how can we prepare the state of Colorado to better serve people of color and communities of color at a time when it makes so much economic sense. It's not just a moral obligation, but demographics are such that the future workforce of this country is indeliably tied to the growth of Asian Americans and Latinos. 
So really excited to share it. I'll put it in the chat and, and thanks for the platform. And I, and I have and I have to do a little shout out here because I've printed it. So uh, thank you. Please download it. And NPR did a wonderful cover on that. So I was really excited. Awesome. I want to return to Colorado because we're talking about the, the, the number of Latinos and that as Latinos go, so does America, right? And we want to make sure that we get counted. So let's talk about the census. Let's talk about you know, what's happening there and, and, and your efforts in the Colorado. I know that uh, a deadline has been pushed up, but I'll let you talk a little bit more and explain to the audience. Thank you, Dominica. If I can, you know, just also jump in on what Sonia was, was talking about in terms of, you know, making sure that our the recovery of COVID, that we just don't go back to the status quo, right, to, to how it used to be, because we have to literally address the systemic issues that have created the inequities, that have created the disproportionality. Uh, and so it means that we do have to, you know, come out of this, not just not leaving anyone behind during the response phase of it, which we're in now, but as we think about planning for the future, we got to make sure that people of color are also at the table, um, solving our problems for ourselves, along with other community members, that we are at the table at city council, that we are at the table with state governments, at the governor's office, and at all levels of government to make, it, to make sure that recovery is going to be equitable, that recovery is going to be uh, forward thinking, that we're not going to go back to the same old ways that created the inequities around health care, the inequities around housing, the inequities about poverty, that's policies that create people, that people in poverty, people don't want to be poor. People are poor because of systems and policies that create inequities. And so I just wanted to, you know, share that, that we look forward to those uh, bold, broad conversations, because it has to include every single Latina and every single Latino and every single person of color and every resident and every community across the country. I think in terms of the census, you know, part of our vision as a organization, the first Latina, Latino-led organization in our tri-county area is to be able to create power, right? It's about agency and it's about power. And so it starts with census. It's, the, you know, it, it, we have to make sure that we're counted. Uh, Eagle County, Garfield County, and Picking County were undercounted. We are reflected as 30% of Eagle and Garfield and 10% of Pickin, but we're far more. There's more Latinas and Latinos that just simply are undercounted because of the very systems that keep us in the shadows, that keep us not voicing or not allowing us to be able to voice and participate in some of these basic uh, civic and democratic institutions like the census or voting. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to move past COVID in a true recovery that really ensures that all residents, that all citizens, that all communities have a seat at the table. Yeah, thank you, Alex. I just want to kind of wanted to add to that because, you know, it's really difficult when you're a Latino leader and you're trying to like tell your community, you know, you should trust the government, trust, you know, trust our sheriff department, trust the census, you know, even though we're hearing these mixed messages from the White House and from other you know, from other organizations. And it's like, we're kind of like swimming against like the or swimming against the current, right? Because you have this like main like message coming at us, but then we're saying another message, but then we can't trust our institutions. So I think this is also really reflecting that, you know, they institutions, certain nonprofits, um, school districts have really failed our community at so many different levels. And there's these levels of mistrust and we are having to organize ourselves. We're having to translate and like re like appropriate things and we give it a new lens and a new culture and approach in a whole nother way. And we're doing this for our own community. And it's really hard to be, you know, not being part of these organizations, but knowing how it's going to implicate and how it's going to affect our own community and it's taking a like the life out of us right there's so much so many hours in the day to make sure that you know our community is well informed that our community can trust some of these processes and that our community can really understand what it means to be a part of this bigger system um so it's it's extra you know three times the work to get one person to participate in the census. It's five times the work to get one person to vote. So again, not trusting these institutions and having these institutions fail us is just making this hard, just this work so much harder for our community. So I hear two things, right? That we are trying to, we're solving the problems, creating our own solutions, co-creating it with those in the community as well, being mindful that it's their voices that we're amplifying as well. And at the same time, we're developing ourselves and trying to get a seat at the table so that we can impact policy 
and, and be able to get the funds that we need and access to capital to, to really take our, to grow our communities. You, you both talked about fear. And what's evident is that how, do, how does a community who's afraid of be, being accosted by institutions of power navigate a pandemic that requires contact tracing? Yeah, and, and it comes, you know, I think it comes back to the architects and the designers, uh, the people who are at the table, right? This is why it's important to make sure that when county governments at the local level, at the micro level, um, when they're making decisions as to what the strategies and the resources and the people we're going to hire and the models we're going to use, that we have people of color and people who understand the cultural and linguistic elements of our community so that we can then uh, execute programs and execute strategies that are going to be linguistically and culturally appropriate. Um, I think at the micro level is where, where the where the action happens. It's the county managers, it's the county commissioners, it's the city council, you know, members. It's it's it government at the local level who are making choices sometimes in communities like ours in the Roaring Fork Valley with without Latinos at the table. And so it, it's no it's no you know it's not a surprise to me why some of our strategies are not hitting the mark. It's no surprise to me why we oftentimes create more division sometimes than inclusion because of the architects and the decision makers at these tables that, you know, you know, even with good intentions, good intentions do not mean good impact, right? We've learned that the hard way in America and throughout the world. And so we've got to make sure that we're more inclusive in, in communities like ours in the Roaring Fork Valley or the Colorado River Valley or the Eagle Vale River Valleys. We got to do extra work because we're a little behind the times. And I think it's, it's about partnerships. It's about all of us working together and creating more spaces for people of color to lead in their own communities and to give agency and power back to the communities because right now there's a vacuum um, and, pe and people are being done to and not with. I, I just want to just join Alex on this because this, this is a message I hope to drive home today. Um, I mean look at California we make up 15 million 39 percent of the population and you look at the counties that are hardest hit right now, the representation is not there in terms of the design at the highest level. And too often it, we are looked to when it comes to execution and implementation, right? And both of them matter. The, the design of how we think about these strategies to the time when we say, okay, well now we're gonna hire community health workers. Well, were they at that table and designing how that tracking was going to take place? Um, and making sure that lived experience is valued as much as the degrees behind our names is critically important. And I have to say, you know, we don't have to give anyone power. The people have the power. It's just a matter of giving them the opportunity and the place to be able to just exert that power and use it for the betterment of everyone. I mean, this is a message that Beatriz and Alex are driving home today is that this, whether it's Colorado or California, the rest of the country, as Latinos go, so will the rest of the country, so will the rest of the state. And so when we bring in the folks that are high, that are most impacted, right, those are closest to the problem, know the solutions best, because they're living it. And so we need to bring them close to the table and have them design the solutions and also execute them. So then I, I, the question I'd have then, what are those solutions that, that have been designed by Latino, Latino-led organizations that we should share with the rest of the country? You know, one of the things I'm, I'm so excited Alex is here, I do a lot of work with this organization called NALEO, the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials. And at the start of the pandemic, we would provide a lot of technical assistance and data and facts to state legislators and then to our local community college board of trustees and school district representatives and mayors. Some of the important ideas that I want to lift up. One was testing. It was pretty clear who was getting hit and the fact that it was so hard to get a testing location. This was true in Florida, it's true in Arizona, and it's true in Los Angeles. And so local leaders were really important in doing everything that they could in their bully pulpit to ensure that their constituents and other residents, frankly, had access to this. Other ideas that were really important is, you know, really providing Wi-Fi as school board members in Texas to our families, not only for the students, but so that they could access information on how to stay safe during this pandemic. Uh, one of the other issues that I want to lift up, and uh, Denver has a city clerk, uh, Paul Lopez, who is Latino, is thinking through vote by mail and recognizing the safety, validity, and importance of keeping all residents safe and making sure there's no unnecessary loss of life in order to participate in a democracy. 
So taking charge and recognizing that you have low propensity voters or first time voters for vote by mail and that they need additional information. Um, I think we've seen all of the work that wonderful people and organizations have been doing across the country around the census. The work is still not done. But in terms of COVID, we do have people leading. And as we see a leadership vacuum, whether it's in Washington, D.C. or in our state capitals, the important thing is, is that state and local officials have an outsized role to play in who lives and who dies. And they're doing it at a time where it's a matter of first impression. So I really want to commend um, the elected officials that are really trying to keep their families and their residents safe. And I was just going to add, uh, you know, in Colorado, I think we've seen also when 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 the system allows uh, leaders from the community to design their own solutions, and when state government takes brave, bold moves to dedicate resources to fund those very programs that are going to be most effective, we see the result of it. So there's you know bright spots throughout the country, and certainly in Colorado, you know the the San, San Luis Valley is working on a promotora model um, created and led and in, both designed and executed by people of color organizations and leaders from the very community who are impacted. And they're working in partnership with government, as it should be. Uh, and together, that synergy is going to save lives. It's going to keep people from being, you know, exposed to viruses. It's going to be. It's going to keep people away from being hospitalized because of the disease. Uh, and we have many other bright spots. And I think we. Uh, locally at the local level, what the role that we have been playing as Los Unidas as an advocacy organization is to highlight those bright spots, to highlight those models, and to share those with our local government and leaders to say there is a way and there are some models that have been very successful already led by people of color in partnership with government and other institutions and are saving lives today, are saving Latinos, particularly because of the importance in our community where we're just not disproportionate, disproportionately being impacted. When you have a 70% of all people that are infected by COVID being Latinos, that we, we need to create a different word. That's not, that's not just disproportionality. That is an injustice. That should be criminal. Something is going on and we need to solve it. Thank you. In terms of economic models, right, because it's the health piece, but let's talk about and a lot of the work that Latinos in society has done around business growth and scaling Latino-owned businesses right now our businesses are being just uh, devastated uh, i think most businesses a report from the stanford uh, latino entrepreneurship program that i think 75 percent of the businesses have less than uh, like, uh, savings for six months to operate so i want to talk about those ecosystems uh, that are necessary infusion of capital because to to make it through your health and then you have to provide for your family and that's the reason people are risking their lives right uh, doing essential work so Jacqueline, I'll go back to you because you have a program um, that share a little bit about that, both nonprofits and entrepreneurs that you support in the local community. Yeah, so Dominica, earlier this year, we launched a Latino Entrepreneurship Fund um, for a number of reasons, coming back to this theme of solutions need to come from within. Um, you mentioned some of the numbers of uh, one out of four businesses, small businesses that are open or open by Latinos. You know, in the 2008 recession, it was Latinas who helped California bounce back. The rate of opening up uh, new businesses increased by 111% between 2008 and 2010. And that rate was what helped California really take its take this by the reins and bounce back. And so I want to repeat certain themes here, invest from the people who are closest to the problem. Number two, as Latinos go, so will the rest of the state, so will the rest of the country. And as far as the entrepreneurship fund, we did it because those racial, the, the institutional racism that exists prior to this pandemic was exasperated. So the PPP loan, for example, how many of the businesses that we worked just didn't, were unable to tap into those resources because they might have been tied to uh, institutional bank uh, because the community banks didn't have the wherewithal to quickly respond. And so those are the things that we need to undo and rebuild in a new way for the next normal that we're all aiming for right now. And so one of the things that the Entrepreneurship Fund aims to do is invest in organizations like Prospera, for example, out in Oakland, who incubate immigrant-led businesses and invest capital, technical support, marketing and communications. But more importantly, they provide familia for these women who are starting their businesses to learn from one another and tap into each other as experts in their field. 
But I have to tell you that, for example, the CDFIs, the Community Development Finance Institutions, how many of them actually are Latino led? There are hardly any. In the state of California, we should be thinking not only how to create that infrastructure, but how do we also pass through funds, whether it's the governor who's making funds available for small businesses, or when the federal government makes that money available, making it available through non-traditional ways so that those who've been locked out of the system have access to them and can actually invest and recuperate and rebuild again. So we just have a few more minutes. So I wanna allow all of you to sort of do a call to action and a message of hope. Our Latino community is so resilient. Immigrants are so resilient and we will find a way. And, and we, we look within the community and we also lean on others to, to help us. Um, what is your message? And, and say something about the resiliency of Latinos and then the call to action to, to build on that, to make sure that we have a lot of hope for the future. You know, I want to say, like you were saying, we're really resilient. We're really creative. Um, a lot of times we're not seen for all we bring to our community and the networks that we build. And I guess my call to action is, you know, let's really participate. And as Latinos, let's be a part of an active part of creating a better future for ourselves and for all our community. And, you know, to elected officials, you know, and people in power realize that the fact that you have not been able to share and have not been able to see us as an equal is really hurting not only our community, but the community as a whole. And I think like Alex was saying, we're not gonna go back to the same normal. We're not gonna go back to the status quo. It's time to move forward. And we have a great opportunity to do this together, to do this together as a community and to do this together as peoples and understand that this is the future. And there's, we, again, we have a great opportunity to make things right. I'll just add, uh, you know, our ancestors have been through it, right? So that bloodline runs through us. And so that I, I sometimes I struggle with the word resiliency because none of us want to go through the issues we've been going through. Um, but we we figure out a way through our faith, our family, those around us that hold us strong to get up and rise up again. And we will rise up from this, um, just like the phoenix from the ashes, right? And what I hope to see is all our young people who are organizing in the streets right now, who came out in support of Black Lives, who are the ones also putting out the message to get out the vote. It's them who we need to invest in. So our audience right now, whether in the philanthropic sector, the business sector, in the public sector, it's it's investing in organizations that are allowing these young people to use all their power to lead us in the right direction and to ensure that our democracy is firm and strong and lives up to its ideals. And I would just add um, one thanks to the Aspen you know, Institute uh, and to your program, Dominica, um, and just the importance of, it, of, of creating infrastructure led by people of color in every community. It's the only way communities are going to thrive when all of us are at the table, when all of, us have, all of us have access to that same opportunity, to the same access and networks, uh, and, and that we're also the same, our own designers and our, our own architects of our own solutions. I also just want to thank Jacqueline for everything that she does. Does as a, as, a, as a community foundation in California. We have our own here in Colorado. We as Voces Unidas would not be where we are today without the help of the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado out of Denver. Uh, a big shout out to Carlos Martinez and, and his team for their leadership. It is that type of leadership that creates and incubates and allows for organizations like ours to be able to thrive. And thank you to the entire Aspen community as well for their support uh, over the last three months. We've only been around for three months um, and you know we have many 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 more years to go and we can we look forward to the partnership with the Aspen Institute and the rest thank of the you Alex I'm gonna have for you have to forgive me because I want I literally have half a minute for Sonia what's your call to action vote 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 by mail safely and vote in person if, if that's your thing with your mask and and let's safeguard our democracy um, I want to see my family and friends again, and I, I want to see our nation thrive. And I think we need some change. And it's not just top of tick ticket. It's, it's state governors, it's state legislators, and it's our local elected officials. We're going into redistricting. Our vote matters. And if you have not filled out your census, fill it out. This is money to stay safe during the pandemic. Thanks so much, everybody. Well, I want to thank all of you for your insights, your passion for being change agents in our community. Uh, we need you there and we're here to support you. My role is to elevate Latino voices, insights, and leaders. 
And with that, I turn it back for question and answer uh, to Crystal. Thank you. Great, thank you all. This is a fantastic conversation. Um, you all are amazing. Our first question is, um, I love what Alex said about sharing power. Can we break down some of the impactful wins within that? I hear giving voice, social capital, for example. Are there any real life wins you can talk about? Yeah, you know, I think we have, you know, a great example happened this past November in the Roaring Fork Valley for the first time in our school system, we've elected um, the first homegrown Latina to the school board, a school district that is educating 60% brown children. And so, um, you know, for that school district to be able to have the right policies to be able to be truly inclusive, we need to make sure that those, the community that's being served by these government institutions are at the table making these policies, um, hiring superintendents, um, talking about the policies and the programs that are going to be effective for our children. And so that's, a, I think, a very, you know, live and vivid example. Jasmine uh, Ramirez is, is our, happens to also be my representative. She's also happens to be a co-founder of Osas Unidas. And we want to make sure that, you know, more and more of these examples exist throughout the valleys. We need Latinas in every single, in every single town council. We need Latinos uh, in every single decision-making town table to ensure that we are uh, being, you know, we're crafting solutions for our own communities and we're part of the solution and part of the ecosystem. Great, thank you. Our next question is, I am really concerned about the inclusion of Latinos in clinical COVID trials and who will determine the priority for who gets vaccines. For example, will priority only go to essential workers what about their families who may not be essential workers? This is an important um, item to address given the spread of COVID in Latino families and communities. Who would like to address that? I mean, this is, this is the million dollar question for which there's no clear legal answer that we can point to, but we need only look at yesterday and the last few weeks and the last few months in terms of what is likely to occur which is that those are most marginalized, those that are working class, those that are working poor, those that are of color are gonna be the hardest hit and face the most barriers to accessing these things. One of the really important kind of prisms that I wanna lift up is that when COVID testing started happening, we saw that the hotspots were in very affluent communities. If we take Los Angeles, for example, this was West Hollywood, uh, Bel Air, Beverly Hills, and it was because they had access to providers that could provide those tests. And now, months into this pandemic, the racial ethnic disparities are clear. And it is Blacks and Latinos and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders who are just uh, dying, frankly, at rates that are disparate from white Americans. And this was the result of a lack of testing and tracing. So in terms of actually receiving the vaccine, vote. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, I live in the Seattle area where the Latino diaspora is less well represented and also less connected as a community. How can Latinos who are disconnected from their diaspora help their Latino brothers and sisters? So I'll jump in and answer this question. Just like in Colorado, there's a Latino Community Foundation. There's also a Latino Community Fund um, in Seattle. And I'd encourage uh, folks to connect with them because they, like us, also keep a network of Latino-led organizations, grassroots organizations that support and, and work with, with the community. So it's a good start to get connected there and engage and become a philanthropist. Again, you don't have to be an uber wealthy person to be able to give back and invest in your community. It's a good start. And when I say investment, I like to say time, talent, and treasure. Right? There are opportunities for us to connect with these organizations and serve on their boards, volunteer, support the leaders that are on the ground on the front line. And if I can also just add, you know, I think supporting uh, groups that are informal and need the capital and need the monetary support to get going, right? This is the experience of the Roaring Fork Valley. We've had informal groups of Latinas and Latinos for 20, 30 years, yet we haven't had access to resources, to capital, to infrastructure, to, to, not, to technical supports. And it, and it takes, you know, it takes that level of support to be able to create your own organization. And then hopefully you're not the first, you, you're one of many, um, you know, into the future. But, you know, you can 
donate, you can support these efforts, you can work through your own community foundation, even if they're not Latino, you know, the Aspen Community Foundation locally has been a great partner. We also wouldn't be here uh, without their, their support early on in our, in our, in our journey. Great, thank you. Uh, we have an interjection on, on that point. Uh, if those watching, we have the contact information for these Latino led organizations in your chat box. Uh, so please support Latino Community Foundation and uh, Voces Unidas and uh, Defiende Nuestra Tierra también. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is How can we better protect Latino workers during COVID 19? Many are undocumented and do not have access to health care, for example. One of the things that's really easy is that everybody during this pandemic should have access to testing, tracing, and care. And excluding people only jeopardizes entire communities' public health. Now, another thing is we just came out with a report on Monday out of UCLA, and Congress had meaningfully excluded mixed status families from relief from the individual benefit under the CARES Act. And we calculated that that exclusion cost the country $10 billion and tens of thousands of jobs. So again, it is not a moral thing. It's necessary for us all to stay healthy, but it's also important for economic recovery. I'll just add one quick point to that. I think also uh, governors need to be holding um, certain agricultural sectors and just the, the private sector accountable for protecting their workers. Um, the, the mandates are there, but we need more accountability. And that's where we need our state governments to step up and step in. And just to add on top of that, Beatriz, you may, you're probably going to say this at the micro level. We also need county governments and local municipalities to also step up and work with industry to ensure that workers, from housekeepers to landscapers to construction sites, that those companies and those industries are doing what's right, which is to provide information and provide protective gear to make sure that our community is not being is not being infected at work and then coming to their households and then infecting the extended family, because that is what's happening in the Roaring Fork Valley. And I would add to what Alex is saying, you know, really come up with solutions and really look at our community as it lives, right? We live really densely. We live in mobile homes. Um, this is a reality. It's really hot, hard to quarantine and to isolate yourselves. So we really have to come up with bold solutions and put the resources behind with hotel rooms, with, you know, food delivery, whatever it takes to make sure we're not spreading the disease and come up with solutions that, you know, are, are taking down all the barriers that don't allow us to access a lot of these safety nets. Great, thank you. Our next question is, what are organizations in the more rural areas of the nation doing to provide resource support for migrant workers? How do we organize to provide for our agricultural workers? Um, how do we involve the rural communities where a large percentage of our agricultural workers are alone? I think this is, yeah, this is not a simple fix. It's really about systems. So if we think about why there's high incidences of infection and of death and mortality, a lot of farm workers and rural migrant workers, my mom was a farm worker in South Texas and in the Central Valley of California. They don't have adequate housing. They don't have adequate transportation. They ostensibly will be near people and unable to practice physical distancing. They also don't have the protections as other workers. Those of us that are working at home, like myself, for my kitchen table. And so some measures that lift everybody up in terms of their living wage, ensure that they have benefits, retirement security, those are the things that we should be doing now. There's no other example that we need to know that that's the important thing to do to keep these farm workers safe. It's not incumbent on local individuals to do this and to solve this gap. This is a society role. And I'm hoping that we're really thinking about reinvesting and doubling down on our social safety net. I wanted to also add that rural America is very diverse. Um, that's the other part that I really see, you know, a lot of our leadership failing in is that they think about Latinos and they always want to put us in like urban areas, right? Where there's more power, there's more organizing. And we never see the Latino in rural areas. And Latinos have been the ones keeping rural America alive. Um, mm -hmm. If we really look at the numbers, there's tons of little businesses and, and Latinos are, are what keeping rural America just working as it is. So I think we really have to realize and elevate the leadership of Latinos in rural America as well. Great. 
Okay, I think this is our last question um, and it's a um, couple parts again. Um, what percentage of Latinos have a, co a college degree, particularly in comparison with the general American population? And how do you feel about creating vocational programs within the Latino community and job placement programs? I'm glad whoever put that question in this conversation because we all know that um, economic in, an inclusive economy will also include uh, more access to higher education and also retention and graduation rates to increase. Right now, 11% of Latinos have four year degrees. And that is not, that, that's inexcusable. And that's a systemic problem uh, because we know that Latinos are graduating at a faster pace from high school. The numbers have gone up 25% in the last decade. They've also are enrolling in school at a faster and, and higher rate but the graduation rates are not coming up. And it's in part because of the lack of financial support. It's also because our institutions have not hired the necessary leadership to come up with ways where Latinos feel at home in these institutions. And number three, we need to come up with better ways to connect people who are going to a four-year degree with real jobs and not just jobs in any sector, but high demand and high salary job. As people are going into college, a lot of them are first generation. They're also supporting their families. So how do we make the connection with those that are going into college to then come out and not only support themselves but be able to lift up their families and break generational poverty and so it's a great question to ask and it's something that i'm hoping that as a nation we rethink as we think about the future post-covid I just want to give a shout out to the Aspen Institute Latinos in Society program. We at UCLA are so excited to be partnering on an answer to this very question, which is the digital workforce and the digital economy and the ways in which Latinos across the country are and are not able to engage fully. And one of the reasons that Latinos are being decimated by this pandemic is we're just oversaturated in frontline essential sectors. So I'm, I'm excited to partner with Aspen on, on figuring out how we can get a bully pulpit uh, to lead us all into genuine pathways to opportunity. In and local, lastly, just, I'm sorry, go ahead, Alex, go ahead. No, go ahead, Jacqueline. No, I, just 30 seconds. I mean, California has an opportunity with Prop 16 to also undo some of the damage that we've seen in the last couple of decades. So there are opportunities right now to increase those numbers and make something happen. Go ahead, Alex. And locally, I was just going to say, we look forward to working with industry and working with big companies like Aspen Ski Co um, in local municipalities and governments to ensure that we're creating opportunities for Latinos at all levels, right? We can't just think of job opportunities at the lowest wage jobs and lowest skilled jobs. We have people with bachelor's degrees with masters with we have medical doctors who are not practicing medicine we have architects who are not practicing architecture we have many folks in our community we have great talent but we need to all of us work together not just on the k-12 and higher ed side but also once they leave and once they have those degrees they need to be able to have access to those opportunities where they can truly lead and be ceos be executive directors be medical directors that's be, be, be governors be president be whatever it is that they want to be Indeed. Um, fantastic. Well, um, thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Dominica. You all are amazing and you're doing really critical work. We now have a very special performance um, of an original musical piece entitled Flor de la Primavera by Grammy nominated Amaros, an ensemble made up of artists Stephanie Amados um, and Andy Abad. Uh, Stephanie was recently a semi-finalist on the number one rated first season of La Voz on Telemundo, which is the Spanish language version of NBC's The Voice. Andy is a Grammy nominated producer, best known for his mastery of a wide spectrum of genres, including pop, rock and Latin. Um, most people or many people um, sadly have lost loved ones and are grieving. And we too recently lost a beloved colleague, Lara Kinney. We dedicate this song to her memory and to her family. Please enjoy this beautiful song. Thank you. Sido unos latidos. 
Bravo. Thank you so much. That was so, so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Amados. Uh, thanks to all of our uh, panelists. Thanks to our audience. Please join us for our upcoming events. Uh, this coming Tuesday, August 18th, we'll be featuring a new event that we just planned, the Artistry and Scholarship of Shakespeare. And also on September 16th, our McCloskey Speaker Series program on criminal justice transformation in the age of COVID and beyond. Thanks for joining us.